Uh, it's been incredible. Uh, as you guys know, Ran Ran's a, a relationship builder. It's kind of his superpower, I like to say. Um, but us being on the same page, if, if you're on the same page with the, the front office and the coaching staff, uh, you can really do a great job finding the right people and right players to, to fit your team uh, when everyone's looking for the same thing. And so that part's been really fun. Uh, I enjoy being around Ran every day and, and Chad Brinker too. Those between me, Rand, Chad, uh, and Anthony Robinson, we probably are in and out of each other's office um, probably 10, 12 times a day. I mean, we're always talking, going back and forth, um, but it's been a really, really fun partnership to build, a relationship to start to grow with, and uh, it's been it's been a blast. How is Premier talented left, left tackle? <clears throat> I'll say this, you, you can never you can never replace elite talent. Um, you can coach guys, coaching makes, it, makes an impact, it matters. Um, but ultimately, the better players you have, the better coach you are. Uh, and so I, I will never um, pass up on elite talent just because I think we have a great coach. Um, great coaches with elite talent uh, is special. And so we're, we're trying to get to that point. Uh, but I will say there's, there is times when you can take players, though, as in, in roles that, you know, maybe not necessarily in the, at the top of the draft or for top dollar in free agency, but um, where you can develop players quickly and they can contribute for you. Because uh, as we all know, you're going to have – multiple uh, uh, multiple sets of players playing up front. Uh, very rarely do you stay with the same five for the course of a season. Um, so that development and that depth is always going to be really important. Uh, and there's nobody better at developing it than him. Yeah. That whole conversation, yeah, I, I mean, it's you want guys that can carry the ball, uh, you want guys that can protect, and you want guys that can be dynamic out of the backfield. Um, sometimes that's one player, sometimes that's three. I think what's happening is is that's that division of labor uh, is being divided up amongst that room. So you're getting two and three guys that are contributing more uh, than maybe just one guy all the time. And so I don't think there's a devaluation of the running back position. I think the division of labor has been separated um, a little more. So uh, that's probably the best way to say that. There's, there's, you have to have good backs. Um, there's really no way around it. Obviously, there's a, there's a positional spending that goes with that, but uh, to have good running backs, ones that can protect, ones that can win routes in the pass game, can catch, ones that are explosive, and then you got to have guys, too, that uh, sometimes when you need two yards, they're, they're going to pound for two yards and, and make it hard on a defense to tackle them. So uh, I don't devalue the running back position. I know how valuable it is. You just have to have a lot of different types of them, uh, ultimately, when you're building that room uh, for your team. What is to bring in and add to this team that isn't already there? Yeah, I think there's an element of, of explosiveness, of speed that, that we can add that would help us. Um, this is a really fun class of, of players, really from the top part of the class all the way down to the bottom. There's, there's going to be good receivers, I think, you'll find that will come off the board in the second, third, and fourth rounds that I think will be uh, contributors for some teams. So it's a deep class. Um, there's really a lot of variations of, of player. Um, there's guys that are good with the ball in their hands. There's guys that are really fast. Um, there's guys that are big and strong. So there's a good mix of, of talent that fits. And um, when you're building the receiver room, you're trying to collect a little bit of all of those things. And so um, it's a fun class to evaluate. And, and hopefully we can find a couple guys that fit us. Um, I think you want, you want a guy, first and foremost, that can play. Um, because if they have to play, you want to be able to, to get out of a, a, a two, three, four game stretch. Um, and hopefully not an eight or nine game stretch like Jake Browning had to get us out of last year. Um, but you want a guy that can first and foremost play the position. Uh, there's another element of backup quarterbacks that's really important is how they are in the room with the starter, and that matters. Um, that relationship can be very fruitful. Uh, it can also be uh, very damaging uh, if it's not on the same page. And so having a starter with a backup quarterback that's that's there to help, that assists, that sees things through the quarterback set of eyes um, can be very helpful on game day. Uh, with the starting quarterback. Uh, it's a role that I think is probably undervalued publicly, but you talk to most coaches around the league, that value of that position I think is, is pretty high. So to have a guy that can be in that role that can one play and two help the starter is, is important. You evaluate. And that's, that's a healthy thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I think we're all high level competitors. We all want to win. And so uh, when we feel strongly about something, the expectation is uh, to stay why. And if you disagree, you also are expected to stay why you disagree. And, uh, we'll make a decision on whatever that issue might be together and we'll move forward together. But but I think conflict is good. It's it's a cause for growth. Just because you have conflict doesn't mean you don't get along. Um, I think it's probably a, an important way to say it. This talent is, is, is nothing. Yeah, that's always the hard part when you when you know the level of competition is always part of that process and, and how do you how do you justify uh, what they've put on tape 
versus lesser competition versus someone that's playing in the SEC uh, against Alabama. So that's always that's the job. That's what makes it hard. That's why it's not an exact science. Is um, you're trying to project those guys a little bit. You know, Cooper Cup coming out of Eastern Washington. How do you how do you know that he's going to be as good as he's been? Well, you hope that you can find the, the mental makeup and the traits enough uh, on the tape and in, in the meetings with the person that you feel like he has the ability to do something special. Ryan, to be sort of a certain type of offense, you know, high high volume, high production. Or, you know, I don't I mean? think so. I don't think so. I think you you see backs nowadays. I know there's that myth of volume carrying where you got to have it 20, 25 times. I don't think that exists. I think there's a place for, for rotating backs. I think staying fresh matters. Um, obviously, he's taken, taken a lot of carries over his career. And so if you get in a position where you got two really good backs that offer very different skill sets, I think it's always good to change those up. It's good. It's good scheme uh, and it makes it hard on the defense. So uh, I don't think that you have to, just because he, if he came back and he didn't have to have 20 carries, I don't think that necessarily is a requisite. What kind of this talent is, is, is nothing? Yeah, that's always the hard part when you, when, you know, the level of competition is always part of that process. And, and how do you, how do you justify uh, what they've put on tape versus lesser competition versus someone that's playing in the SEC uh, against Alabama? So that's always, that's the job. That's what makes it hard. That's why it's not an exact science is, um, you're trying to project those guys a little bit. You know, Cooper Cup coming out of Eastern Washington. How do you, how do you know that he's going to be as good as he's been? Well, you hope that you can find the, the mental makeup and the traits enough uh, on the tape and in, in the meetings with, with the person that you feel like he has the ability to do something special. Brian, really An ideal world where guys don't put football aside and train as track athletes. Um, yes, I mean, I, I mean it's. But that's, it's all kind of part of the process. I do think that you're seeing players become more empowered, uh, understanding that they have uh, leverage, that they have um, the ability to, if you're in a position like him, you don't have to do all this. Uh, everyone knows this talent speaks for itself. There's a lot of guys that do have to do this, and it does matter. So um, I don't want to lessen the importance of what it means for a lot of other guys. There's probably four or five guys a year that might be able to do what he's doing. Uh, but if you're in that position, there is something to not training to run a three cone and training to run uh, in cuts and, and and football train because all these guys train a little bit different. So he'll probably be a little bit more prepared right off the bat, but ultimately all these guys catch up and get right to where they're Would it be to. nice though if everybody didn't have to become a track athlete for three months? It could be. I just don't know. There's, there's certain guys that you just don't know about, and I think it's important for them to get exposure. Um, speed, agility, see them in person. Um, some of these guys need this process to, to make a name for themselves. Um, the guys that have already made a name for themselves obviously may choose to do this more in the future, but that's a really important process for probably 90% of the guys that are here uh, to be able to show the show for themselves uh, in the draft process. Well, so, yeah. Your first draft with these guys, mm -hmm. of, of how good a scout, you know, running back coach is versus cornerback coach and how much weight to, to give guys. Are you talking about coaching evaluation? Coach, coaches as, as scouts. Yeah, I think coaches always have a unique perspective. The, the evaluators evaluate talent, um, and they look at measurables. Um, they look at profiles in terms of athletic abilities. Um, coaches sometimes look at the football part. Um, how do they play football on tape? Now, most scouts have some feel for it, too, but um, guys that aren't evaluators of talent sometimes have a better perspective of what the player looks like and how they fit. Um, and so sometimes there's a good balance of, of talent evaluation and measurables versus coaching and, and fit. And so that's what you hope to get the best of both those worlds to find the best players. Um, but there's a lot of times there's a difference involved in, in their what they see on tape, and it's a good thing. But the, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the NFL is about scoring points, and, and having people that can, can score points uh, is important. Um, I would say that that situation and our situation are probably very different. Um, both in the and what the, who those players are uh, and where we are in our, our process. So, um, you know, we were going into year three, and you know, Jamar Chase and Penny Sula, I think, were kind of unanimously considered to be all pro caliber players. They both lived up to that billing, um, and so it's a different set of players, different set of circumstances. But you know, I'll always lean when all things are equal. Uh, guys that can score touchdowns tend to make more of an impact. All the, what's all the talk about receivers? Last two. You always cross train guys. Um, I do think Peter's best position is at guard. Um, but you always, you know, until you get your hands on the player and they're in the building, uh, there's there's always a cross training element where guys will, will, will swing in different spots. Um, but I do think his, his best position at this point is to probably. Marvin Harris.